Hello and welcome to Corgi Town USA. I am Candy, owner of Corgi Town USA and host of this podcast. In my lap is Chuckles, our spokes gorg. Hi, I'm Catherine, and somewhere at my feet is Digby, my son. Oh, you know where he is. And, uh, well, <laughs> oh, there he is. There he is. My, my fur baby. Yes. And Booger's in here, too, warding off his advances. This is true. Um, she is our senior member and rescue um, of the Corgi Committee. And we also have Tito Bandito, the youngest member. He is in his crate. Otherwise, he will knock down equipment. And we also have Mortimer Barnabas. So the whole Corgi Committee is here. Yay. And typically, we have a guest, but this is our season finale. It is. So we thought that we would talk, we talk a lot about this on the show, but uh, about finding the right breeder and why it's so important and um, how we always encourage rescuing. Always. Yes. Um, we understand that's not practical for everybody. And some people want a puppy and um, we're behind that. We want to help you purchase mindfully. And again, we, we talk a lot on the show about it. Um, but we wanted to make our season finale kind of all about what's in a good breeder. Okay. For corgis specifically. For corgis specifically. Um, but some of this applies to breeders. So um, let's kind of start with, you know, breeding programs and how every breeder you get the dog from should have genetic testing. Absolutely. Th there's no excuse not to. Yeah, there's, there, with, <laughs> I'm sorry, but now I, you know, I am a, 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 a rescue Mom, mm -hmm. Same. Um, I am, uh, I have never gotten purchased a, a puppy. Per, I've yeah. never purchased a puppy. Yeah. You know, I, I have paid the, uh, um, Arizona Humane Society, you know, Maricopa County. I've never purchased a puppy. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm cheap. I'm cheap. Let, no. Um, and the amount that any, uh, dog or cat you know, they breed cats, mm -hmm. the amount that you are going to pay for said animal and the amount of gene the, the cost of genetic testing. Yeah, no, it's an, it's a no brainer. It, it's yeah, like, you pay a lot more for the, like the full birthing program and if they need a C-section and aftercare and yeah. And, yeah. and for the, for the breeding stock themselves. Yeah. High quality breeding stock dogs are expensive. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm Thousands sure. Thousands of dollars. And, uh, and, and, and the bottom line is if somebody tells you, oh, well, you know, you don't need it or, oh yeah, it's too expensive. I would have to charge somebody. No, no, they would not. Well, cost of doing business people. Well, but this is, and this is where we could get ourselves into trouble is there's a big adopt, don't shop crowd. Right. Um, but I, I never, I'm never going to argue with you. Mm -hmm. If you say adopt, don't shop, I said, yes, please adopt. I've adopted several times over. I've yes, you have. And I'm very passionate about it. And I'm part of a transport group and we support our rescues as much as we can. We try to get it out there. We try to share. I even have a waiting list of people looking for rescues whom I connect with in different regions. Yes. Um, we do as much as we can to try to place rescues. That being said, rescues, shelters, bursting at the seams. Bursting at the seams. And it is a multifaceted problem. But it is my personal belief from experience that part of the problem is off the rails breeding. Yes, definitely. And with, especially with our uh, our specialty uh, hey, shelters. So, for it's, example. It's all shelters. It's, it's all, I don't know any shelters or rescues that aren't like. Um, all shelters are bursting at the seams. Mm-hmm. Eric and I uh, just did our first foster, or we're in the middle of our first foster, a mama and her six babies. No puppies. If you can do fostering, it tremendously helps the whole system. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm doing fostering for animal control in Maricopa County here in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, they have every dog imaginable, every mm -hmm. every breeder. And all shapes and sizes. All shapes and sizes, yeah. um, including the adorable ones that I've got right now, Ooh. available in August. Yes. Um, Hit up cat hit up cat and the mama who's so good anyway. Um, no, what I was, uh, alluding to is that the breeding, we, we see more of the bad breeding problems in breed specific shelters. That's what I was trying to say. Right. Cause it's a fanfare breed. It's a fanfare breed. Yep. And that's what Enthusiast. we Enthusiast. Uh, if, if there's a, a popular breed, there's yes. going to be more of an opportunity for a breeder to make money. Yep. And unfortunately, there's a big dark side to that. I don't have a I don't have a problem with breeders making money when they're doing it for the right reasons. 
the ones that aren't doing it for the right reason. So it's okay for, to me, it's okay for a breeder to make money on it because it takes a lot of money to oh, put yeah. into it, like we're saying. But there's a difference between that and cranking out puppies because they're cash cow. Puppy mill. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of my, again, this is based on experience. I've rescued several times. I've also purchased puppies. Yes, I've done both. And I truly believe that poor breeding is one of the biggest problems and overbreeding and just off the rails breeding. And you have breeders that can't place puppies. You have puppy mills. They're cranking them out. You have people with backyard litters and backyard breeders. It's just bad. So we're here to give, not shame anyone, but give you the information. The more that you purchase from backyard breeding and puppy mills, the more you are keeping them going. And we want to shut them down as a source. And how can we do that? By educating you on what makes a good breeder. Yep. And and just uh, a quick from a uh, an interview we did several weeks ago, a uh, puppy transport uh, couple that will take get puppies from breeders, mm-hmm. puppies that are yep. too old mm-hmm. to sell. And bring from them, the mills that from the they mills, age out. Yeah. Right. And, and bring them up to... Um, uh, up to a particular rescue that they work with uh, over on the East Coast, one of the misconceptions is, well, if I buy from a puppy mill, then I'm saving that puppy. No. When when you buy from a puppy mill, you are saying to that person who is running the puppy mill, keep doing what you're doing because here's some money to say that it's support. You know, it's supporting a it's business supporting. we're trying to steer away from. Yes. So let's talk about what's in a good breeder. So if you will remember a couple seasons ago, we had Murphy and the unethical breeder. That was in an episode we did with Jenny Lane, who has Murphy. Yes. Little one-eyed Murphy, who now has a brother. Oh. Yeah, they have a new little puppy brother. And she had decided they wanted a corgi. She'd had dogs before. She'd had both rescues and breeder purchase, if I remember correctly. And she decided she wanted a corgi. And her idea was that if she had an AKC registered breeder, she was looking in the right place. Let's talk about how that's a half truth. That's not just because they're on the AKC list does not mean that they are a reputable or a good or a decent breeder. And she found out the hard way with all of the problems that she had with Murphy. He was in a poor situation. He was bred poorly. She recognized it when she went to pick him up. Oh my goodness, this is a bad situation. What have I done? So she came on the show to educate. Here's here's what not to do, right? Which we're all grateful. She has Murphy as she. she. Um, But she'll never buy from that breeder again and she'll make sure that nobody else does, right? So that's that's the work we're out here doing. Uh, Murphy has a good home and no, um, she's trying to make sure anybody who will listen doesn't buy any more puppies from this, this particular breeder. Now, the AKC registration is just something they should have. It's, it doesn't mean it's a good breeder, but it's something they should have. It's too easy to do. It's a registration. It's, it's just something they should have. Now, here's the good part of it. It really doesn't matter, especially if you have a pet. We're, we're not talking about show dogs. We're not talking about um, any of the, some of the specialties that you need. We're right. talking about specifically just pets, right? Our beloved pets. Why, you know, AKC, why does it matter? It does not matter if your pet is AKC registered in any scheme of health of your dog and well-being of your dog. No. Except when the breeder is registered with the AKC, you have a registry of the dame and sire. You have several generations back of that dog. So you can trace back where it came from. There is value in that. Not only for genetic maladies, but also knowing where your breed came from. We know as far back as we can trace, we we have better health, better health opportunities if we know what's down the line. Yes. So genetic testing, number one, AKC, they just should have it, but that's only a small part of the That's sort of like, uh, I'm I'm going to equate it to, is the, you know, is the shoe store, because that's what my parents- How about a high school diploma? Well, no. Just something you should have. It's something that you should have, but just <laughs> high school diploma. Or you can, you know, you can get a, you've gone through the whole program or you can get the bare, bare minimum. So is a high school diploma. No, what I was going to say is like, let's say the shoe store that you go to in your neighborhood um, happens to be a member of the Chamber of Commerce. Well, it kind of helps a little bit because you can turn to the Chamber and say, you know, you know, you have a member that's not very great and the chamber may keep their eyes open, but 
really anybody who can pay the fee can be a member of the Chamber of Commerce. Right. So it has its pluses. It has its minuses. Don't look at it as a whole thing. Look at it as a tiny part of the puzzle. Is the bottom line is it doesn't mean anything. No. It doesn't mean anything. It just is something they should have right. in, in the grand scheme mm -hmm. of all the things because then you have lineage. You know yes. where your dog came from. Why is this important? Crossbreeding? Make sure that the dog's not crossbred. Yes. We have genetic problems. We can have behavioral problems and health issues with crossbred dogs, just like in humans. You got to keep those gene pools separate. That's just one example as to why AKC is a good thing to have, but it's only a small part of the puzzle. Genetic testing, specifically in corgis, you know, the big three, Von Willebrand disease, it's a ble bleeding disorder that corgis uh, tend to, tends to be high up on the list of them being at risk. Um, they can test against that before breeding. Exercise-induced collapse. It's a, it's a heart problem. Yes. Um, that's, it's a scary thing to deal with and 100% preventable by testing before breeding. And of course, degenerative myelopathy, which I have dealt with firsthand. I also serve on the board for Shade Out DM. We're the group that's awareness that is here to tell you there is no excuse to be breeding DM at risk dogs. We have heard some arguments as to why Others think it's okay. Personally, I have not been convinced. Nope. Um, part of it is some of the research is not out. Just because they're at risk doesn't mean they will develop. Let me tell you, I don't think it's worth the risk. No, it's not. And that's one argument. Um, breeders will also talk about some breeders. Let me be, be easy now and don't come for me. I'm just trying to make sure that I advocate for our animal friends. Some will say that you are reducing your breeding stock by getting rid of that risk. I understand that, and I and I, I do respect that because we do want well temperamented dogs. You still have not convinced me it's okay to breed at risk. No. And I've just not have been convinced. So um, EIC, VWD, and DM, degenerative myelopathy, ex exercise induced collapse, and von Willebrand disease. The other things to look for are PRA, which is uh, it's separation. Um, uh, PRA is it's it's genetic. So, and it's an eye problem in corgis that's also prevented by testing before breeding. There are also some others. Corgis are very high with IVDD, which is inadvertible disc disease, which is sort of a blanket term for disc disorders in dogs. Now, all of our low riders are at some semblance of risk because you don't get a nice short low rider without the dwarfism gene. Yes. And the dwarfism gene brings IVDD risk. Now, there are multiple copies. So if you have two copies of the IVDD, uh, the genes responsible for creating it or putting them at higher risk, rather. Um, IVDD is preventable in, in ways. So not letting the dog, we learned that with Newton because Newton had the surgery and he came out of it. Some don't. Buttercup has IVDD. She has the wheelchair. Yes. She's actually moving these days a little without her wheelchair. It's not a fun thing to deal with. And uh, DM is not painful itself being genetic, but it ca can cause pain from overcompensation and not being able to move naturally. Whereas IVDD is painful. It's painful, um, yes. And it's, it's, you have a 50-50 chance of the surgery, the very expensive, very invasive surgery. Not working. Yes. And then being able to walk. So it's, it's high risk. It's something to ask your breeder about. Uh, I don't know enough about the IVDD to know like, oh, you shouldn't be going to a breeder that breeds both copies. I'm not going to say that because I don't know enough about breeding stock and about you're going to have a risk with a dwarfism gene. That's why we have to be careful about how we pick them up, how we move them, and how we let them move. Um, but it's good to know the level of risk. So if your breeder oh, provides that, that's a good thing. Now, there are lots of genetic diseases. These are the most common um, that I think that those three – the VWD, EIC, DM, they just should be doing that. So AKC, those three, 100%. IVDD and PRA are good to know about. Also, let's talk about conformation. So the OFA hip and eye regs, the regulations have to do with, you know, what is the condition of the eye genetically? What is the condition of the hips? The reason why this matters to you is as they age, they get degradation, again, because of their structure. So you want yeah. a well-conformed dog. If they're not bred well, their bone structure could be weaker and you have higher incidence of injuries and you have higher risk of uh, early onset arthritis. So Hammer was my DM baby. Hammer also had horrible hips. He would have failed OFA. Now, right. I got him as a rescue. Um, and he, I understand he was a breeder retire. So he's got puppies out there, both at risk for DM, unfortunately, because he did succumb to it as well as having really, really bad hips. And we'd actually had the hip dysplasia surgery on one side. So these are things 
you know, good bed, uh, good, better, best, right? So best consider PRA, IVDD risk, as well as hip and eye regulations. Again, we're not saying this to be judgmental. We're not saying I am not a breeder. I respect you breeders who out there do this important work. Feel free to drop in the comments something that you think I missed if you're a breeder or a perspective that you think I'm missing because I do respect what you do, but I'm here to advocate for our animals and the health of our animals. I am not a breed elitist. I believe in healthy well-tempermented dogs that live a good, happy, healthy life when they are yep. relaxed and they are confident and they're highly trainable because they can live with us harmoniously. It is all about the love of our animal friends. That's why I say all this. It has nothing to do with being a breeder, breeder elitist. So here's a hot button issue. Let's talk about American Corgis. We're fairly certain that our Digby is an American Corgi because yep. he, that's what his registered paperwork said. Got him as a rescue. Um, and then I fostered him and then um, now he's a cat's and now baby. He's, and now he's my baby. Yeah. Now he's cat's baby. And he, he, he was purchased from a breeder, uh, didn't have that information when they bought, bought him. They didn't know about, you know, American versus, you know, bed, better, right. And good, I think, better, best. Well, so a possible, not great breeder. He has, I wouldn't recommend them. He has I know. the markings of a, a, cardigan. a cardigan corgi. He has merrill eyes, meaning one brown, one blue. And I do joke with people when they see the dog. This is an ongoing joke. I do joke with them when they see the dog. They say, oh my God, he's got one brown eye and one blue eye. I said, that's how I know that my fiance is his father because my fiance has one green eye and one blue eye. <laughs> and people look at me and they go, oh. Really? I love people. Um, the Merrill is a cardigan uh, attribute. Yeah. The, the shape of Digby, the size of Digby, the yeah. coloration of Digby, these are all, although we do know a, pure, a couple of pure cardigans, uh, a couple of pure Pembrokes that are the same color. Um, but what I've been told about the Merle gene is that Pembrokes don't naturally carry it. Right. If there is a Merle gene in there, then it could be passed down from maybe there was a cardigan in the mix somewhere. I, I don't know. Don't hold me to that. But your risk with breeding your cardigan to your Pembroke is you could be breeding a double Merle and not know about it. Right. You get and blind and deaf. You get blind and deaf with a double Merle. High risk. Yeah. High risk. And um, uh, Queen's Best uh, Corgi Rescue in California has their calendar with uh, with with one of the babies mm -hmm. is a double merle yeah. that piglet and I am yeah madly precious. in love with piglet. Uh, here's here's my kind of and then right. Caitlin we have Caitlin who was on the show and I believe season two she rescues and fosters blind and deaf corgis and she does from local mill rescues. Yes, yeah, yes. But the, 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 the okay, so he he is most like he. Digby is most likely a cowboy corgi, a Pembroke. Um, cowboy corgi, corgi is a mix. A cowboy corgi is a mix. It is a Pembroke cardigan mix, or he no, is No, cowboy can be cattle and, dog mix. Right, it can cattle be, dog. Yeah. It could be anything. Or Cowboy is a mixed breed. Please don't mixed. buy from a breeder that breeds cowboys. That is a mixed breed. Right. And, um, and... He was the paperwork. Th this is my point. Is that the American? paperwork said American or no? I thought he the, the paperwork Did it say said Pembroke. Pembroke. Okay. Okay. The point being, Digby's paperwork says Pembroke. He is so obviously not a Pembroke. One that's like one strike against you. Like, well, there can be. Gen let's give benefit of the doubt. There can be genetic maladies, but we also don't have. Uh, genetic testing information from nope. them. The breeder didn't provide that. So just that's why I wanted to bring up American Corgis. American Corgis, Cowboy Corgis. I'm never going to recommend you to a breeder if the breeder willingly breeds those because now again, I love all the Corgis. I love all the doggos. I love all the little furry animals. I love them so much. That's she why I'm up here cats. talking. <laughs> of course I do. But that's why I'm up here talking about this because I want to advocate for them. It's not that I think anything's wrong with them. You are out there with your cowboys and your Americans. I love them so much. And if you've already purchased them and you didn't know and you don't regret it, you shouldn't. They're wonderful and they're perfect the way that they are. That's right. What I'm telling you is if you are here to purchase a puppy, 
see if that breeder claims to do cowboys or Americans and don't purchase from them because we, you are paying for a mixed breed dog, which are not recommended to be mixed because of the genetic problems that they could have. Also cattle, the cattle dogs are very high energy working breeds. Corgis are high energy working breeds. You are breeding two high energy breeds by temperament. You can have some neuroses on the temperament. So that's another reason they're not breeding for temperament. And there's a lot to be said about temperament. Again, not because we love crazy dogs any less. Those are some of my favorite to train. It's because when the dog is so neurotic that it can't, that it's hard to be trained and it's hard to relax, the dog is less happy. And we want happy, relaxed, want confident happy, dogs. We want happy, relaxed, confident dogs. We also For their want, safety and their sanity. We also want dogs that the parents are happy and confident yeah. and relaxed. Too many of the dogs that we find in shelters are, I can't handle them. It's their, well, it, their behavior. Their behavior risks. is, you know, their behavior is too much. Aggression, anxiety, which where aggression stems from. Right. Yeah. All of these things end up filling up our shelters because yeah. they were not bred properly. So I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate for you. Uh, yes, a blue healer, Australian cattle dog. Um, we had one, uh, Eric's had numerous, that's his favorite and Corgi, uh, working dog, uh, slightly mm, hyper, uh, cattle dog, mm, slightly hyper. I had now we breed the two of them. We get potentially a neurotic dog. Mm -hmm. Why are we less neurotic if we breed a good lineage, uh, Dame, uh, Corgi, Pembroke Welsh, Corgi, good lineage, and, uh, Sire, Pembroke Welsh, good lineage. Why are we less likely to get mm, crazy from them? Because temperament is part of good breeding and you have, as a trainer, we never discriminate against any of the breeds. No. Every dog is his own dog his or her own dog, 100%. However, certain breeds are going to have proclivities to be certain ways. So a, a corgi is a high energy working dog. They're sprinters. We say my corgi sleeps all day. Yeah. Cause they're sprinters. They have spurts, Yes, but they're still a high energy working dog. And that is why you don't want to mix two extremely high energy. You could get a neurotic dog because part of behaviors is genetic. Are you saying that it's a, almost like a different high energy and the two high energies are colliding because a corgi and a corgi are two high energy dogs. Right. But you don't, they have different, they have different proclivities. They're, they're high working dogs, but you still have to pay attention to the degree of, of it's a generality, right? So just because a Pembroke is high energy, if you're, I wouldn't breed, if I'm a breeder, I wouldn't breed too high energy always has nervous energy to another high energy. Oh, yeah, no. it's, it's the same reason. Yeah. It, you know, it's just, you so, have higher proclivities in, in the cowboys. And I can tell you from experience and even talking to my friends that work in rescues that your cowboys wind up with behavioral problems pretty often. Mm -hmm. um, again, a generality, if you have a cow cowboy, I love them. Don't get me wrong. I love all of them. I want to save them. That's my, why we're talking my, about my this. Ba yeah. He, Digby is definitely a little bit more neurotic, neurotic <laughs> than, um, than most dogs. A lot of nervous energy, yeah. a lot of nervous energy. Sure. I'm not going to, you know, kick highly him trainable out. though. Highly we've, trainable. We've trained him quite a bit. Oh no, he's trainable. I'm not. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's a whole You're other, feral. That's a whole other <laughs> You're show. Feral. And gentlemen. We, we don't know what to do with you. You're just feral. Um, but it's, I, I wanted to bring up the point because I'm sure as people are listening to our show, as our dear listener, we're not viewers, hating on them. We love them. Not only we're not hating on them, but dear listener, dear viewer, you're sitting here going, okay, but wait a minute, high energy, high energy. What's the difference between high energy, high energy, or high energy, high energy. There is, it's, it's a, a temperament breeding. It's a temperament breeding. It's a different high energy. It's, it, there's all kinds of different things in genetics. And unless our dear listener, dear viewer is in fact a geneticist out there. Mm -hmm. um, remember failing that class in high school? Remember biology and all that stuff? Well, and it's we have some breeders who who listen to us and thank you. And, and you feel free to weigh in. There yes. may be a perspective here that I'm missing, but I'm saying all this again on behalf being their voice. 
of these animals. Yeah. I want happy, relaxed dogs, happy in homes. And right now we have an influx of poor temperaments. We have an influx of behavioral problems. We have an influx of mixed breed and poorly bred dogs. And I'm trying to give you information. Um, if you can rescue, please do. We need it. I've rescued several times. Cat's rescuing. She's fostering. We're 100% pro rescue. So if Absolutely. you want to say adopt, don't shop, I'm not going to argue. I'm say, please, yeah, please, please rescue. If you want a puppy, I'm not going to shame you. I'm going to give you the this information, like, please ask for these things at least. So continuing, now that we've talked about that, about mixed breeds and AKC yeah. and why that should be considered. Limited litters. That's huge. It's better if they have a wait list. Um, sometimes you'll find one that they happen to have them available, but when they always have one available, that is a red flag yep. because that could mean, one, they have too many dogs. Two, they are breeding too often. Yes. And so my favorite breeders I've, I've known have limited litters and even better if they live in the home with them. Yes. Not in kennels. I, I prefer that. The few, again, I don't typically recommend one or few breeder. I give you the information, but every now and then someone will ask me, I really want a specific one and I will. Those ones that I have are ones that the dogs live in the home with them. Yep. That means they have limited litters. They're well, well cared for. They're never in the elements. They're not there to fend for themselves. They get plenty of human interaction. Yes. It's so much better for the puppies and for the adult dogs. Yes. So also, I am not a big fan of breeders who retire. Now, this one may get me in trouble because we have some breeders listen to us. Again, I'm open to your perspective. Here's what I know about breeder retires. When they are done making the money off the dog, they will sell. And some, not all breeding programs do this, but some do. I'm not a fan of it because I feel like you're not keeping the poor baby and having them as part of your family when they're done making money for you is kind of the way I see it. And people pay a lot of money for, for these breeder retires. Now, Hammer was a breeder retire. I, I right. didn't purchase him from no. a breeder. I got him secondhand even after that. That was his third home. Um, and I'm so grateful for that because I never would have had him otherwise, right. regardless mm -hmm. of everything. But I'm not a fan personally of breeders who do that. A lot of them do even the, the reputable ones. So I'm leaving that open to say, if you want to correct me on a perspective that I don't know, and, I'm just not a fan. Right. And you're not, a, and, and we discussed this before we went on air and, um, and my question out there is, you know, well, when somebody does a rehoming fee versus, you know, selling the, the, um, the dame or the sire that was their breeder for a while. Now what happens? You, the, the two pups have, uh, have retired. They're not breeding anymore. It's, you know, we, we don't want to overbreed them. Okay, great. You've retired them. You know, what is the difference in finding a good home for them? And maybe you don't want to have so many dogs in the house. My perspective, um, maybe you don't want to have so many dogs in the house. So you have the Dame and the Sire and now you have a new Dame and the Sire and then you have all these puppies. Is that now too much to be taken care of? And it's better off if these two dogs go to a different home. The, there, the, there are so many. I still have a hard time with that because I feel like you, it's, they've, they've made you money. They've produced puppies for you. They've given you a name in the community from a breeding program. Mm -hmm. And now you abandon them. They're an adult now. They're well set in their ways. Not that they're not trainable, but harder to place than a puppy. Somebody wants a puppy and you're charging all the money. I just, I am not been convinced. I will leave it open to be Right. Different and, perspectives. But and I, have, and I have a, you know, again, I have a different perspective as well. So we'd like to know where you are in mm -hmm. this debate or, or where, where you feel and breeders, if you are. Give us um, your perspective. Yeah. We, we are here about perspective. We're here to be respectful and open up this uh, discussion, not to lambast, not to, yeah. not to be negative or say anything poorly of you. If you are a reputable breeder, you really believe in your program, you care about your pups, you care about the well-being of your pups, maybe there's a perspective we're not seeing here where yes. this weaves into it. This has been my perspective as a puppy buyer and a corgi enthusiast. So when we're talking about this, I think guardianships should be mentioned as well. So the guardianships are when they have another family take care of the dame or sire until they need to breed them and then they give them back. So they don't actually live with them. That one I'm on the fence about because I feel like, why don't they live at home with you instead of living with another family? Because then you you don't have to care for them on your property. So I would love to hear some perspective on guardianships, but the guardianships and breeder retires are ones I'm just not crazy about. Because again, a couple of my favorite breeders that that I know uh, don't do that. Okay. For good reasons. Yeah. And I've actually, actually had the conversation. How do you feel about this when breeders do it? 
So here's the other thing. The good breeders will take the dog back. Huge. At any time in life. Things happen. Okay. We're not, um, rehomes happen. Interpack aggression happens. Um, it, allergies happen. Um, allergies happen. Deaths in the family, life situations, health issues, things, you know, all these unthinkable things that we don't wish on anyone and we wish no one had to deal with. They are a reality. The breeder will agree to take the dog back at any time in their life because they have a vested interest. So that should be part of your contract with your puppy. Also yes. a spay and neuter contract because you've agreed not to breed with them. Right. If you are given the option of breeding rights and you are not a breeder. Don't take them. That is a red flag. No, that's a red flag. It's that's not so flag. much don't take them. If you are not a breeder and you don't no. have that and they're give, they're giving you that, that's that's a, that means that they don't have a vested interest in that line. Right. And they don't have any control of registration True. to how many generations back. Again, this is all for the pups. This isn't because I'm an elitist. This is all for what is good for the pups. Um, but they'll always take the dog back. They'll have a spray and neuter contract. And you will also be able to go and visit the litter. Now, when puppies are super young, they have weak immune systems. We have to wait. But a good breeder who communicates well and sends you plenty of pictures and plenty of videos and lets you come into their facility when the puppies are ready is huge. So you can see the condition of the dogs and how, yeah. how they're taken care of. So th that's my soapbox. And that's why I wanted to talk about it. Again, we are not shaming anyone. If you're like, yep. oh, I didn't know and I bought from them. Yeah, you have a wonderful dog and I'm so glad you found each other. And there's nothing wrong with that. We just want to do our best to get this information out there. Please stop giving money to um, these unsavory breeders. It, it's starting to be so bad that rescue shelters are full. People aren't buying puppies like they were. So we're finding more puppies in rescue because yes. well, these I've mills, got, they age out of them. Yeah, you have the mom and the I puppies. Have, I have six puppies. and well, I don't think yours was from a breeder though, right? No, mine is absolutely not They didn't from a spay breeder. or neuter. They, they didn't spay and neuter. Yeah. So so there's a, there was a mama running around and she will be spayed. Um, that's the other thing. Yes, there are so many unhomed dogs mm -hmm. and cats. And if you have the opportunity, like you said, if, if the uh, breeder says, oh yeah, you don't have to spay or neuter them. Well, one, that's a red flag. Two, that's a freaking problem mm -hmm. because any animal can get out, any animal can get in, and we have a huge problem. Homeless pet situation. Homeless pet situation. The, the, our Maricopa County, um, the Arizona Humane Society, all doing free giveaway weeks mm -hmm. because there are so many pets. They are looking for um, people like me to foster, just get the animal out of that situation so that they can become adoptable, so that they can find their forever home, so that they can find their loving family. And now I'm crying. Yeah. Well, yeah, because it's heartfelt. That's why we're doing this. But that's, I mean, also that's not for everybody. It takes a lot of work to foster. Oh, you have a house full of, you are essentially doing breeders work without being a breeder. I mean, that's some serious stuff. You're losing yeah. out on sleep. You're having to make sure puppies stay healthy, that they get the, the nutrition that they need and the yeah. vet care that they need. I mean, this is serious, serious stuff. It takes a lot of work. And we're trying to capture it at the source by yes. telling you, you know, please rescue if you can. If that's not an option for you and you really want a puppy from young, please purchase mindfully. Please listen to what they say. The whole reason I say all this is to advocate for the animals so that the ones that are being bred are being bred mindfully and with care and that those that breed them care just as much as you will as their parent. Yes. Right? And, and if you have, so, um, I had friends, we had friends, uh, used to live here, they've moved, that would go in their neighborhood and trap cats and have them Fix spayed them. and neutered yeah. and then re-release -re them. If you have an opportunity to support something like that, whether it's for dogs or cats in your area, spay and neuter, spay and neuter, spay and neuter. Thank you, Bob Barker, spay mm -hmm. and neuter. He did do some good work there. He did yeah, do some sure. good work there. And that's the only way we're going to get this the, these issues under control. Yeah. And thank you all to thank do you. work in rescue, transport, foster, big, huge hugs. Thank you so much. All our veterinarians. Yeah. I've and vet techs. Oh yeah, for sure. And, and I've rescued several times and now cats doing the foster road. I mean, it is, it is an emotionally 
taxing situation to try and clean up the problems of others. Um, and then you, you love this animal so much. You just want them happy, healthy. Um, so thank you so much for doing it. Um, we don't take it lightly and we're out here trying to make it where there is less of that and less of a need for people to go through it and for pets to go through it. So that's right. I think that's good, right? I think so. Right. Hopefully we haven't scared you off. Uh, usually our subject matters are not this heavy. We just wanted to put out a little PSA um, on what's going on and what I think is one way to help stop it. It's not, it's multifaceted, but that's one way to help stop exactly. it. And and we're going to do everything we can, but otherwise uh, we will be taking a break for the end of season five conclude season five unbelievable ah. yeah, but we'll be back in a couple months to start season six and typically we are here for you every thursday we have over a hundred episodes preceding this one for you to choose from it's all about traveling with your pet health grooming training all the good stuff health of the breed creator series we have a lot of things that are pet centric that are much lighter uh, we hope that you like and subscribe and keep with us and if you have any questions please find us at corgitownusa.com. And we are happy to advise you if you have some notes from a breeder you're talking to on if we see any red flags or if we think that it's a good one to go to or if you're wanting to rescue and you need to be put on the wait list for your area, happy to connect as well. That's right. And don't forget, like and subscribe. Yes. That <laughs> helps us keep doing keep this. doing what we're doing and helping our fur babies everywhere. Yeah. All right. Well, we love you. We will see you next season. Have a happy summer. Bye.